As we begin our message this morning, let me share with you from Colossians. This is the final week in this series uh, called In Christ. And as we do so, let me read just a little bit from Colossians chapter 4. Paul writes these words in uh, chapter 4, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. This is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Then Paul goes on and shares a number of greetings Uh, regarding a number of people. He talks about Tychicus and Onesimus and Aristarchus and Mark and Jesus who's called Justice. All of these people who are with Paul and they all send greetings, he says. Then Epaphras, listen to this, verse, uh, verse 13. Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. He always prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. I can assure you that he always prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Hierapolis. He talks about Luke and Demas. And then Paul himself says this, uh, please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters in these different places. In the end, he says, here's my greeting at, with my own handwriting, signed Paul. Remember my chains. May God's grace be with you. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We have uh, been seven weeks in this series called In Christ, in Colossians. And let me just do a quick review. We started off the first week, Pastor Steve had a cross in here, and he talked about how we're redeemed in Christ and that God has moved us from one side of the cross to the other, from enemies of the cross to being friends of Christ through God's work and redemption in Jesus Christ. We were redeemed in Christ. Uh, The next week, we talked about being reconciled in him, that it's only through Christ. No other powers can reconcile us to him. We talked about the mystery that's been revealed in him. It's been revealed not only to Jews and Gentiles, but also to us, that we are rooted in him. And if we're rooted in Christ and we stay rooted in the gospel, we won't get carried away into all kinds of other sorts of beliefs and false false doctrines, false beliefs about God, being rooted in Christ, raised in Christ. Jesse talked to us about how if we're raised in Christ, then the old self needs to die. And the very next week, we talked about being renewed or robed in Christ, that we have new clothes, and they're called forgiveness and love and grace. Last week, Pastor Steve took us to relationships in Christ, how all relationships have been changed based on our relationship with Jesus. And today we close with, how do we remain in Christ, our final week in this series of Colossians? Well, this is uh, Memorial Day weekend, and I always like to have some sort of connection to a soldier story or something like that, if possible. And um, the one that I have for today is, there is a a, a bit of a humorous story of a... uh, uh, of a general who went out to make uh, the rounds and inspect the troops. And uh, it was, you know, difficult out in the trenches, and uh, the conditions were bad. It was raining. It was cold. So he uh, slogs out through the mud, and he goes out, and he is looking around, and he sees this wounded, bandaged soldier sitting along the side, being uh, waiting to be taken away by an ambulance away from the, uh, from the front lines. And... Um, he sees him with his head down, uh, rain is kind of coming off the brim of his cap. He sees him apparently muttering something. He thinks maybe the, uh, the, uh, the soldier is praying. So he goes over to the soldier and he listens in on what he's saying. And here's what the soldier was saying. He says, I love my country. I would die for my country. I would give my very life for my country. But if I ever get out of here alive, I'll never love another country again. (laughs) 
you know, maybe that's a little bit of what it's, it's sort of like sometimes in, in following, following Christ. Paul is in chains as he is writing this. He's been persecuted. Paul has a long list of things that have happened to him as a result of his faith. He says, pray for me because I'm in chains. How does one remain in Christ? How do we stay in love when we go through difficulties in our life and we ask questions, why? How do we remain in Christ? And that's what today's message is all about. And so we start off the very first thing in chapter 4 that Paul talks about. It's very simple, you know, this profound theology that Paul has shared earlier in the book. He just says it's very simple. Pray. If you're going to remain in Christ, remain in prayer. And if you want to fill in stuff in the back of your bulletin, you're welcome to do that. Here's what Paul writes. He says this, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. You know, uh, in our modern world, we are more engaged by distractions than any time before our time. I mean, you need to, first of all, be aware of that. Paul says, you know, pray with an alert mind. How can you do that in the midst of all of the distractions of our world? We are more interrupted with text messages and emails that come through our smartphones and uh, through the internet and new messages that pop up as we're surfing. Um, telephone calls, the telephone is with us now constantly. How is it possible for us to be alert in, in our prayer life? Um, I read an article just recently on the internet uh, about, um, about the internet and about the technology that we have today. Uh, some re research is showing that um, we are in danger of us as a society of not being able to take the most important information that we receive during the day and get it into the recesses of our brain where it can be stored long term. Why? Because we're constantly moving from one message to another, one distraction to another, uh, one, um, one, again, a, a touch in some way that our brain isn't allowing the most important things that we want to focus on to get to the depths. And the problem with that is, is our lives will just be lived like an ADD life, just going from one thing to the next. And so what was the answer? The answer given by this particular article was, hey, everybody needs to take time for solitude, for quiet time. And I thought, wow, this relates to our Christian life and today's message. Paul says, pray with an alert mind. And if you're going to do that, you've got to get away from the distractions. Now, it's not just a problem, by the way, of modern day. Even Martin Luther, back nearly 500 years ago, uh, writes about, and I read this somewhere not too long ago, how Luther was so frustrated with his dog that his dog would distract him during his prayer life. And I kind of came to, to know this yesterday. Uh, Marlis had left the house, and I was uh, doing my uh, quiet time, my prayer time, and uh, sitting in the chair, and I uh, close my eyes to pray, and not too long after that, the dog comes over, he starts rattling the dish, you know, and he's rattling the dish, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to ignore that, he'll go, but he wouldn't stop, and he wouldn't stop, so eventually I'm like, okay, I, you know, this is distracting me, so I get up, I go get him some food, I put it down, and he starts eating away at his dish, but as soon as he had finished with that, I, I'm, you know, my eyes are closed, and all of a sudden, I feel four legs on top of me. And now, uh, and now he's in that position where he puts two legs up on the side arm of the chair and two legs on me. That's his position. I want to be petted stage, okay? So he's standing like this. So my eyes closed and petting him a little bit, you know, trying to pray. And, um, okay, so I stopped doing that. And what does he do? But he lays down right on the prayer concerns, which I have on the sheet on my lap in front of me. This dog did not want me to be praying. I'll tell you, but... Here's the thing, I understand Martin Luther now more than I ever did before. Um, Paul says, pray with an alert mind. Why? Because if you pray with an alert mind, you start to think of something else other than yourself. My life is from one thing to the next. It's all these distractions that are calling to me, all of them pointing towards things that I need or want or desire. When you pray with an alert mind, you begin to think. Uh, of others. Um, the Greek here says vigorously. Bring your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole life. Um, you know, some people might ask, well, how do I pray? I was like the five-finger prayer, you know? The five-finger prayer, I start with praying, 
with those who are closest to me, my wife and my children. Then I like to pray for those who point the way, you know, from my kids' teachers, those who are maybe leaders at our own church. The middle finger regarded as your strongest finger, often the most misused finger as well. Um, but the, it's pray for those who are strong in society, leaders in our world. And then the fourth finger, often considered your, your weakest finger, um, is those who are weakest in the world. And then finally, your pinky, the most unnecessary finger, is finally when you have a chance to pray for the things that you want and desire and need. You know, these are ways that, that we can pray. Um, Paul also says this, when you're praying, he says, pray with a thankful heart. Uh, again, the Greek here indicates gratitude. Have gratitude from the, from the heart. You'll change, your life will change when you start to give thanks on a regular basis. When you are saying thanks for anything that comes your way, even the things that may not be, make you happy, your life will begin to take a new perspective. Have you given thanks for that most difficult thing that's going on in your life right now? It's not something we like to do, but 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Paul writes, give thanks in all circumstances. It doesn't say you had to be happy about all circumstances, but it says we must give thanks. And God wants to do something when we do that. Thirdly, Paul asked them to be in prayer for him. As he's writing this, he says, um, don't forget to pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to, to preach about his secret plan, this mysterious grace that it may glorify God in the place where, where Paul is at. Paul wants them to pray that God would give him opportunities to proclaim the gospel, that Jesus Christ's name might be glorified. And I'm going to tell you, I think my prayer life is changing. You know, when difficult or different circumstances come into your life, you, you pray different things. Sometimes you're just praying, okay, God, you know, bring reconciliation here, or God, um, help these folks here, or God, do this, because that's what I think, right? That's what I think is going to be the best answer. But I've sort of come to a new place. And this is a difficult place, and it's a very dangerous place. Because I begin to pray, God, be glorified in that situation. That's right. It's not something I may even want to see happen. In fact, the very thing I may not want to see happen is what may happen as a result when I pray, God, be glorified in that situation. Because things might have to get a lot worse in that situation for God to truly be glorified the way God wants to be glorified in that situation. Have you done that in the difficult places of your heart and life, the difficult relationship? Pray that God would be glorified. Wouldn't that be amazing if we started doing that as a congregation? Imagine the anxiety that would be released from us. If we let go of control of the things that we want and gave them to God and let God be in control when we said, God, bring glory to your son, Jesus Christ, in this situation that I'm praying for right now. And you know that situation for your life. You know what it is. Paul says, if you want to remain in Christ, pray. Pray with an alert mind. Give thanks. Pray for the glory of Jesus Christ to take place second thing that Paul says is he says, uh, remain wise among non-believers. He writes this, live wisely among those who are not Christians and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and effective so that you'll have the right answer for everyone. Another version says, let your life be attractive. Make the most of every opportunity. Are you looking for opportunities to interact with non-believers? You know, in our day and age, it's something we have to work at. It doesn't just come naturally. Sometimes it's easier to talk only about Christian things amongst those who are here in the church. And so we actually have to work at it. Paul says then, make the most of every opportunity. It wasn't, oh, you know, if things ever come around, maybe you'll, you know, think about saying so. No, he says, make the most of every opportunity. A few moments ago, I talked about Vacation Bible School. I'm calling it the big week. Do you remember last um, February, this past February, when we had the big day? 
And we'll have big days around here uh, from time to time. And um, we had the big day right before that great series, You Make Me Crazy. And it was a great opportunity to invite outsiders, people who are without a church home, people who are disconnected from the body of Christ, because You Make Me Crazy just sounded fun, and we could invite people, and it was great. And now, let me tell you, this is another great opportunity for you to invite someone's kids to not the big day, but the big week. The big week of Kingdom Rocks, I think, is a great opportunity for us as a congregation to do that. So I really ask that you'll look in the bulletin, look at those three lines, add four or five lines, whatever you need to to it, of people that you want to invite to VBS this year. There's a little card in your bulletin. If, if you run out, we have dozens more for you to use. But be intentional. Make the most of every opportunity, Paul writes. VBS is so well done. We have great music, great leaders, great activities, great stories from the Bible. It is the can't-miss opportunity to invite someone to church. And, you know, the decorations, the place is transformed. The kids have a great time. What's not to love about it? It's an easy score for you to invite others. We're, make the most of every opportunity. Live wisely among those who aren't Christians. Paul writes this also. He says, be gracious in your speech when you're around others who aren't Christians. You know, so often it's so easy for us to be judgmental about others, right? Who are living a different lifestyle, who have different values than you or I do. And so what does the outside world say about Christianity? George Barna, in all his research and polling, it says uh, typically um, that outsiders view us as hypocrites, right? We're judgmental. And why is that? Maybe we're not listening to Paul to be gracious in your speech, to love, to, to give the grace of Christ. That's what gracious means, to give the grace of Christ to others who may seem different from yourself. Paul also says, be attractive with your life. The things you say and do will reflect on what's in your heart. I'm not talking about here the kind of beauty that's on the outside. I'm talking about the beauty that's on the inside, to be attractive to the world. You know, when someone cuts you off in traffic, what's, what's your, you know, how do you handle that? Marlis, don't say anything here. Um, so, you know, when you're going up to the grocery line, you know, it's a hurry to get there before, you know, go ahead. What, what, how are we viewed by outsiders? You know, are we just competing with the rest of the world or are we blessing them? Is there a blessing coming out of your life to them? Is my goal today as I leave here to bless someone on the outside of these walls or is it to judge them and condemn them? Paul says, be gracious and attractive when live wisely among. He says, that's how you'll remain in Christ. Why? You won't get caught up in what the world's doing. You'll be concentrating on blessing others in the name of Jesus Christ. That's how you'll remain in Christ. By prayer, your focus will be there. By living wisely among others with, with grace, you'll be following Jesus. And finally, Paul writes this. He says, remain connected to other believers. Um, the book of Colossians ends here with this myriad of greetings. Uh, Tychicus, uh, Paul sending him with a report of what's going on. Onesimus, there's an interesting character. Uh, doesn't sound like much to you at the moment if you've never heard the name, but there's a whole book in the Bible written about that guy. The book is called Philemon. His, he was a slave and his master is Philemon. Paul brings Onesimus to Christ. He's a runaway slave. Paul brings him to Christ. And now he's sending him back to his master. And he's saying to Philemon, he says, I want you to receive him back, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. Paul transforming relationships. Um, Aristarchus, who was with Paul in prison. Mark, there's another interesting story. In the book of, in the book of Acts, we hear of this guy named John Mark. This is the same guy who had caused a division between Paul and Barnabas. He had abandoned them on the missionary trail. And Paul's like, you know what? You go with someone else. I, I just can't deal with that anymore. And, and Barnabas says, well, I'll take him. And Paul says, well, then I can't go with you. And 
Paul takes Silas and he goes off in a different direction. And here we hear later on that the two of them had been reconciled. And Paul is, is um, referring to, he's giving a reference that they should accept him in the community. Jesus, I like that guy. Um, well, that's not supposed to be that funny. But Jesus um, is, uh, he had to have a new name because, you know, the real Jesus had the name Jesus. So they call this guy Justice. I think that's interesting. Epaphras, I read about him earlier. He's the guy who started the whole Colossian church. Paul's saying, he's praying for you every day. I just want you to know how much he's praying for you guys to bring a full witness to the glory of God in your life. Luke, he's the guy who wrote the book of Luke and Acts. Uh, Demas, another friend. Uh, Paul says, hey, give my greetings to our Christians and, and brothers and sisters there. Laodicea is a town nearby. Nympha is a, a, a woman who had a church home. Archippus, he simply says, hey, carry out the ministry God has given you, man. Paul says, remember my chains and may God's grace be with you. You know, the reason I kind of went through this a little bit is you can't go it alone. You need to remain connected. If you want to remain in Christ, you have to remain connected to other, others in the Christian faith. You can't do this by yourself. I've had a couple of uh, young people in my office during this past week. They've a college age uh, kind of life, and uh, one's in college, one's not, but both in that same age range. But, you know, both of them going through difficulty and struggle and, and just readily admitting uh, this has been a time where they've been far from any individuals in the Christian faith. And it's just happened so easily and so quickly. And on this graduation weekend, I just want to encourage you graduates and parents to to find ways into that Christian community. It's when we become disconnected that we become disconnected from Christ. You know, Marlis and I probably send off 150 Christmas cards a year. Many of you do the same. And uh, many of those are to people at previous churches and, you know, and our family members who have all been connected to us in some way. And we can't write to everybody, but, you know, those who have kept in touch, we try to do that. And I think the, the, the importance of it is, it seems sometimes like a chore, but the importance of it is, is that we, we really get to make connections with those who have been important in supporting and nurturing, praying for us. It's taken a whole community to keep us going in the Christian faith. It, listen, the, na- the names that Paul writes, it took a bunch of people to keep Paul going in the Christian faith. Do you think you're any different? We sometimes, you know, believe we are the Lone Ranger, right? Bringing back that movie this summer, making it all new again. But we want to be the Lone Ranger. We want to think that we can do this on our own, but we can't. Paul says to remain in Christ takes a community. We need to be with one another in the faith. As we close this series, I was thinking of a fitting fitting ending. Um, Time Magazine came out um, last month with the 100 most influential people in the world, and the list is pretty impressive. You know, Tim Tebow, um, Hillary Clinton, Mitt Romney, um, uh, Marco Rubio, Warren Buffett, Matt Lauer, ben- Benjamin Netanyahu. I mean, some, some great, great people, and you know, I've been reading about some of those. And one of the things that dawned on me as I was reading uh, about some of these is that, you know, um, these are, are great lives, but they have no claim on my life. Um, so they might be influential, but they have no claim on me. And uh, I began to you know, think about whose picture is not there. And of course, immediately I, I went to Christ. Um, I believe he's still living and alive and the most influential people, most influential person in the world. And then I thought also about you. You know, your picture could be there. This whole series has been called In Christ. And if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, then you have an influence on this world. And what you do makes a difference in this world, whether you know it or not. You know the old saying, a butterfly can't flap its wings in China without it affecting the wind currents in North America. You have an influence in the world. As you pray, as you live wisely among non-believers, as you connect to others in Christ, your influence is needed for the whole world to know that Jesus Christ lives. 
And it's the power of Christ in you that makes all the difference. 